one of your biggest bull predictions that you want people to know about for 2019? I think I'll circle back to Marlon Mack, and I think we see Marlon Mack finish the year. I don't know how bold. I don't want to like get to the point where it's like ridiculous and say he's number one, but I, I, I'm going to go Marlon Mack top three running back in uh, in in 2019. My best and biggest prediction, the one that I feel the most strongly about in the bold range, would be that by this time next year, I'm not saying he'll play this well in his rookie year, but I think Nikhil Harry is going to be a top four wide receiver in all of fantasy within one to two years. All right, well, let's get into a mock draft. I think that's what people are probably most excited for. Feel free to kind of be bold in it, too, and with some explanations so people know, you know, hey, get him later, but this is how much I like this player. I'm not too familiar with some of your players that you like within this top tw- uh, 30 or so. I do know that we, the one player I do know to spoil this, that we both like a lot more than other people is Dalvin Cook, so we'll be fighting over where we <laughs> where we make a fool out of ourselves drafting him way right. higher than his ADP. I'll give you the first overall pick, and for the viewers, this will be a PPR format. It'll be, uh, we're not going to worry about what player corresponds with you know that that pick so if you pick second we're not going to worry about really picking for that that actual team since it's only three rounds yeah uh, it's not like we're going to need to worry about that because you'll be able to no matter what position you went even if you went three running backs all of them will be able to get into your starting lineup so right yep. you are up yeah let's go uh 101 saquon barkley he's been my 101 um pretty much for the entire off season and uh, i'm probably not moving away from him anytime soon i know the situation's a little murky there with obj gone but i just think that means the offense is going to run even more so through barkley i am interested to see what happens in the draft you know do they trade for rosen all these russell wilson rumors kind of floating around imagine wilson over there in, in new york blue man that would be uh that would be something special between him and barkley but barkley is just so involved in the passing game um i i think he'll probably rival what christian mccaffrey did last year without obj there there are just going to be a, a lot of targets going his way so what we saw his rookie year was ridiculous and uh yeah. i I don't think there's any way that we see him, you know, digress from what he did. He's just too talented. So yeah, I up. have to to say, I, I mean, it's hard to argue anybody picking him at the top spot um, just because he's so talented. I do worry about eight man fronts. I do worry about o- Odell Beckham Jr. not being there. But then again, he's been hurt and they survived. But I think it's a little different mentality for defenses when you know. <laughs> Literally, it's uh, it's going to, to Barkley. Um, yeah. But we'll see. I think yards per carry could go down. I think it's going to be harder for him to get in the end zone. He's going to have to make more plays for himself. But, you know, he is capable of that. And I think two or three overall, that's still pretty good. I'm not, yeah. not throwing too much disrespect his way. But so uh, my number 1.01 would have been, and so I'm glad he's here for me, would be Alvin Kamara. And I think that might shock some people. I think some some guys have him three, four, or five. But when you have back-to-back 81-yard uh, receiving seasons, you have fifteen hundred plus total yards in back to back years. It's only two years he's played, and uh, over thirteen TDs in both of those seasons. And he is the hardest working, one of the hardest working running backs in the NFL in a good offense that's going to utilize him. And he's a unique fit for. I, I'm all in on Alvin Kamara in 2019. So I, I would be ecstatic to get him at, at 1.02, even if it's a little bit of a reach. I would take him without hesitation. I like that. I, th- I think there's a lot of flexibility within the first you know four or five running backs because with the whole Todd Gurley D thing that obviously even if you still think of him as a top one two three running back it doesn't make him a sure thing you know yeah Uh, so I I think throwing Barkley Kamara is a surprise to me I haven't seen him go that high but I can't realistically argue it he's a great running back that's ridiculously involved in, in an amazing offense so it's just like you know you don't have to think too hard about this one you could say like you know you could throw out a bunch of numbers and be like this is why you shouldn't take him over Barkley but at the end of the day those three key points great player heavily involved great offense does them losing um, their center, uh, Max Unger, I believe it was, that just retired, um, make you nervous at all? Uh, not too much with with Kamara. I mean, if it was something bigger, um, if they couldn't overcome it, I'm not saying that, that it's not a big deal, but um, I, the, with the draft coming, I mean, they've got so, many, so much time to fix that, and I think they will. I, I don't think the Saints will let that make their offense fall apart. But, I mean, every little thing adds up. <laughs> So, you know, everybody's got something, I think, that can make you worried or concerned. But with Kamara, mm-hmm. how hard he works, how awesome he is. And when people were talking about if Ingram was going to stay or go, that had no relevance to me because he is a 200 to 210 carry back at most in order to keep him healthy, in order to keep him getting his receiving share that could be to the tune of 90 receptions in 2019. I don't care who's running 
with him. He's getting his 200 carries. Yeah, it's facts. All right, so Kamara at two. Uh, at the 103, since this is a full PPR, um, I'm actually going to lean towards Christian McCaffrey. If this was a different setting, I think maybe half or standard, I might lean towards Zeke. But just what we saw from McCaffrey last year, 104 catches. Um, and, you know, people are talking about how his, how his workload might come down. I, I think at, at the worst, it's going to be like Kamara, where maybe he doesn't see as many carries as he did last year. But listen, take those four-yard carries, those five-yard carries, get them off McCaffrey's plate. I don't care. Those those are not what win you fantasy leagues. and not what, you know, put up the points on a week-over-week basis. He's still going to be the most utilized weapon in that passing offense. Um, and he's still an explosive playmaker that can hit the home run at any given point during the game. So McCaffrey, another guy like Kamara, is just you, you, I don't think you have to think too hard about it. So I'm uh, I'm very high on McCaffrey again this year. Yeah, and again, I may have him in a different spot, but like you just said, you can't argue it really. There are just some things that, you know, with this top four, and Gurley is not in it for me, uh, with this top four, I think it's just you can't really go wrong, and it's the one year, and I've talked about this strategy, that I love an auction getting two of, of the top of my top three so getting Kamara and you know Zeke Elliott or two of my top four getting yeah. two of those guys on one team and yes had, being thin you know elsewhere at wide receiver you know drafting a bunch of a slew of, of sleeper wide receivers it's one of my favorite strategies and then top it off pairing it with one of the top QBs um, I think it makes for an exciting potent uh, fantasy uh, powerhouse that you know can win and dominate if you do land your sleepers so um, number four uh, I'm going to go with uh, Zeke Elliott, who would really be my two, my 1.02, um, which is why I think people are a little shocked sometimes when they see my rankings that I have Barkley number three. But Zeke, to me, you know, since they traded for Amari Cooper, he was, I believe, the best running back in fantasy football from the point that they got Cooper on. So, and, and very excited to see him become a PPR, you know, machine, something that people weren't necessarily going to bank on heading into last year. So, really is the well rounded uh, guy that's going to, you know, potentially be a lock for top three numbers. So, you can't really go wrong as long as he's healthy in that part, you can't predict. Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, like I said, the, any of the top four guys, I'm happy with as as being my running back one. The only thing with Zeke, like I said, it, it depends on the scoring format for me because I I don't necessarily think that Zeke is this is the running back that we saw over the second half of last year. Like he's an elite running back, but not in the pass catching game, in my opinion. Um, you know, he was on pace to catch like. 100 passes over the second half of the year or something like that i'm just like i don't know if i I really think zeke is that guy but you know half ppr he probably is my 102 so with him at four completely happy with that uh at the five i'm gonna go with melvin gordon of the chargers he's another elite running back the only concern the only thing putting him outside of that top four for me is just you know a little bit of the injury bug he's missed multiple games in i believe three of the four nfl seasons that he's played in so far but when he's on the field, he's you know producing the same fancy numbers as any of the top four guys there. It's just going to be a good offense again. Um, Terrell Williams is the only piece they lost. They, they bring back Hunter Henry. Mike Williams gets more involved. It, it, it's a lot of the same as it was last year. It's if it, it, At worst, it's going to be an above-average offense. So that's what you look for, a guy who's heavily involved in both the passing game, down by the goal line, um, and, and gets tons of volume. So Melvin Gordon is my 105 here. And to be honest with you, like – if you wanted to take him at the 102 or something like that, I, I really couldn't argue that. Yeah, I mean, the numbers are always there. He's a TD. He's probably the best bet to be a 10 to 12 plus TD guy on the ground mm-hmm. um, than you know, I think anybody here, aside from like, you know, Barkley maybe. Um, so I love it. You know, I think uh, between um, McCaffrey and Camaro, you got a lot more PPR uh, appeal, but, you know, Melvin Gordon is a workhorse and a beast that that I think you can almost bank on like a hundred and a touchdown if he's you know healthy and on the field. So I love I love Gordon. I can't argue with anything crazy and people would call I think just like my Camaro is a little bit out there. I think people call him at one point oh two a little bit of a reach, but I th- I like it. I'm, I'm all about bold stuff, man. That's how I roll. So um, I think that gives the the viewers. And both our audiences a good feel for just how awesome he could be, and that you know you will, you'll let him fall if possible, right? You know, using ADP, um, but that shows how much you really like him and, and how big of a season you expect. So it's good. Um, Hopkins, I think I would probably throw in DeAndre Hopkins right at the sixth spot because you know at this point I do still like some of the running backs. I still like Love Bell. Um, as we mentioned, Dalvin Cook, I do like, but the chance to get the top wide receiver in PPR 
at this stage in the game, I think is a pretty good move, a smart move. And so I would take uh, DeAndre right here, and I expect a good, you know, double-digit touchdown season out of him in 2019. Yeah, I'm with you there. He's my uh, wide receiver one. And at the uh, at the seven spot, I would go with my wide receiver two in Devontae Adams. I think him and D-Hop are just so, 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 so close in, I think, what they bring to the table in, in fantasy. And Devontae Adams is just, um, in a PPR league, his floor is ridiculous, right? He's giving you 12, 14, 15 points every single week. And I'm really excited to actually see what they do here in Green Bay with the new um, coaching staff with Matt, Matt LaFleur coming in. I think Aaron Rodgers is going to have a little bit more rejuvenation. I think this offense can score more touchdowns. And I think Devontae Adams, if you're going to say, you know, Melvin Gordon's a lock for double-digit touchdowns from the running back position, same thing with Devontae Adams. He might not have that, that ceiling that D-Hop might put up on any given week where he catches 11 passes for 190 yards and two touchdowns or something like that. Yeah. And Devontae Adams, I think, does, right? He, he can improve to be that player. Um, but the floor is just ridiculous, and the, and the touchdown floor for me is double digits pretty much. Yeah, I really like uh, Devontae Adams and pairing him with Aaron Rodgers and drafting the two together on a fantasy team. I think that makes for quite a, a exciting fantasy f- season, and with Rodgers falling so far, we'll see where he falls in our draft, but um, I think that's a very attainable approach and gives you two you know, elite studs that can carry you week in and week out. So I do love the Adams pick. He feels very rock solid in 2019, so... Yeah. Can't argue that at all. I think this next pick, so at number eight, I'm going to put Lev Bell. Um, I think will either be loved or hated. Funny how his values climbed really, really fast. Um, there was a point where in early the early offseason, before he even had a landing spot, that he was ranked in the second round. And then the New York Jets were kind of projected, I think, by the general consensus out there to be probably the worst of all the, the possible landing spots. And then his value just climbs. I think it was more of a reality, hey, Lev Bell's really back. Let's start ranking him where he deserves to be ranked. So kind of shocking that we've seen him go up so fast. But I think eight might still make people uneasy and a lot of doubters out there. So you may be able to get him a little further down. I don't know. It kind of depends on your league mates and, and who you draft with. But I think, you know, to me, he, he didn't show any signs of slowing down whatsoever. Um, yes, he held out a whole year, but he's coming back with a whole off season to prepare. So the whole like, you know, he's holding out, he's going to get hurt. That's a wholly, totally different scenario if someone's holding out to week four and getting thrown in there. So I have no problems about his holdout. Um, if anything, maybe it makes him a little bit more rested. But uh, what are your thoughts on that pick, and where would you take Love Bell? Yeah, I have no problem with the holdout either. I I agree with you that it's, I, I thought it was a good thing for his body. Um, I am more concerned about the situation, and I do think the Jets are probably going to overperform uh, compared to where a lot of people imagine the offense is going to be. I think they will take a step forward, but I absolutely hate Adam Gase as an offensive mind. Uh, I think the Jets' offensive line is shitty. I think that he's not going to catch anywhere near the same number of balls that he did in Pittsburgh. So I, I get the the like for Le'Veon Bell, you know, it, there's not that many, you know, it's weird this year. It actually seems like there are, you know, you could look at like 10 or 12 guys in fantasy football and be like, you know, these are workhorse running backs for their respective teams where it was like a big dip for a while, a few years where you can only get yeah. three or four guys, but looking around, you know, you look at like the top 10, 12 guys and there are a lot of workhorses, but of course, by this time next year, we're going to be like, no, there's only three or four. Cause a lot of them will bust. Um, Bell, I, I just don't like the situation. So he's not someone that I, hate he's not someone that i'm avoiding um but at this price he would be he's not someone i want as my first round pick i probably want someone solidified that i don't think is as risky the volume floor is definitely there but you know we've seen many times where david johnson last year the volume floor is not what wins you championships so um lev bell is probably someone i would fade at that spot okay gotcha and it it makes sense and i can i could argue you know i was tempted to go mike thomas here um Mm -hmm. you know i could argue that very very easily um, but, you know, Bell, to me, feels like a pretty decent value here. But, you know, there are risks, and I, I acknowledge those risks for sure. Um, uh, Mike Thomas might be a safer a safer pick. But go ahead and drop your number nine. Yeah, so we're not here to be safe. I know we talked about this guy pre-show. And at number nine, now he is actually currently, I believe, I don't remember if I put him as six on my big board or if I threw the top five running backs and then D-Hop, Devontae Adams, and then – Dalvin Cook, but Dalvin Cook will be in my nine hole. Which, and and just just going off that, uh, most drafts, I would assume, will not have to take him this high. Um, this is 
probably where a lot of people have him ranked, but I'd imagine a lot of drafts you'll be able to get him in between that, like, you know, 12 to 18 range. So yeah. you'll be able to let him fall. However, this is a guy that I want to own on my team. So I'm okay jumping up a little bit. The way I look at Dalvin Cook is, you know, if you look at the board, and I hate going like, oh, if he stays healthy. And I don't think Dalvin Cook is necessarily an injury risk, right? He had the hamstring that he dealt with, but now he's two years off the ACL. And I had uh, Dr. Jesse Morse of the Fantasy Doctors on my channel like a month or so ago. He has no concerns about Dalvin Cook um, being you know, injury plagued or injury prone or anything like that, where he does with like a Leonard Fournette. So Dalvin Cook, as far as I'm concerned, that offense is going to be so centered around running the ball. That is what they want to do. And even if they're not, even if the defense isn't elite like it's been over the last you know, few years, which I don't think it will be again, he is so good in the passing game, right? There's no need for him to be off the field, especially with Latavius Murray gone now. He is that entire backfield, and he's someone that's so electric. So if he's healthy for the full 16, even if you're getting him for 14 games, he's going to be Melvin Gordon, the same thing as Melvin Gordon pretty much. Um, so if Dalvin Cook's on the field – he is a high-end RB1, in my opinion. So yeah. I like the end of the first. And I, and I love that. Before, we were talking about how that was going to be something we were going to race to do uh, is mm-hmm. draft him. And uh, for the point of emphasizing that we love Dalvin Cook in 2019, he's a top five running back. I've done about 15 videos on Instagram and definitely like four or five on YouTube about how mm-hmm. – it's ridiculous the line of thinking people have, how they're attaching risk to him, his name as if he's a top five running back. The way that people speak about it is like, he can't be a top five running back. He's going to get hurt. And, and I keep going back and forth with people on it saying, you know, his value, his upside is top five, but his draft value is 18 to 22, you know, exactly. or 15, or if you have to reach us, I think 14, 15 would be high enough. And you're talking about all of the risk being baked in to that value. He could miss a couple games. He could have a disappointing slow start and still earn that value. And if he doesn't, if he hits a home run for you, you just flat out win your league. That's the kind of value that Dalvin Cook has as your number two player. So, uh, you know, I love it. Can't argue that at all. Um, just the fact that, and like we both mentioned, you could probably get him in the second round. But very, very good statement. We both are uh, a see eye to eye. So I am all in on that. And I'll make a statement, I think, a little later with another player to a similar tune that, hey, take him away later. But, you know, Uh, Mike Thomas will be my number 11. So my 1.11, I think. Or we at 1.10. We're at at 1.10. Let's do a a 10-team league because otherwise I think this this will probably roll on for a long time because we can go back and forth on every player for so long. True. Okay, so 1.10. We're going to make this a 10-team draft. Uh, Or we'll just do the top. Uh, what, 30? Yeah, so okay. three rounds. We'll do top 30. Um, Mike Thomas, I mean, I think that, you know, he's going to be as consistent if, you know, more consistent than anybody, but maybe DeAndre Hopkins. So, you know, having him at this pick, and if we're doing a 10-team league, you could do the, the bookend wide receivers and really dominate, I think, your draft. So love him at, at 10. Yeah, I mean, he's a safe wide receiver. Um, I would actually personally take Julio. I actually, uh, you know, in, in PPR, Michael Thomas is actually a fantastic pick, right? Catching 125 passes. I, I'm a little nervous about the, the passing offense as a whole. I mean, Drew Brees is as, you know, he just had one of his most efficient years ever, but they're taking less chances. They're not throwing the ball deep that much. They are relying on throwing the ball to their running backs on, you know, 30% of their dropbacks, and they don't, they don't take those shots down the field. And obviously, Mike Thomas doesn't need those to succeed. Um, but you like to see, you know, a guy like Julio Jones, if, if you are debating between them at the three spot, Julio gets a lot of shots downfield, you know what I mean, as opposed to Drew Brees, who I'm not even really confident in his arm anymore, even if they do start to take more shots down the field, like, does he still have that strength to throw it all the way down there, you know? Um, so that makes me a little bit nervous. But, I mean, it, it's another guy at, at 10. He's so safe. The floor is so high, which is, you know, uh, what we see with a lot of these wide receivers now. Um, you know, the first five or six guys seem like they really don't have any risk baked into them because they're the same ones that you see at the top of fantasy rankings week over week. So, uh, Mike Thomas, I'm definitely cool with that. I'm sorry. I'm just catching up on yeah. throwing the guys onto the list. We had Lev Bell, and then we had Dalvin Cook, and Mike Thomas at the 10. So, just to do a real quick recap, we had Saquon Barkley, Kamara, McCaffrey, Zeke, Melvin Gordon, DeAndre Hopkins, Devontae Adams, Lev Bell, Dalvin Cook, Mike Thomas. And yeah. I am up at the one or the 2-1, I should say, the first pick of the second round in a 10-team league. Julio, right? Didn't you just... <laughs> well, well... You might go well, right back. Yeah, so listen, if I'm in a 10-team league and 
this is this is kind of off ran for me, but I'm going to go with Todd Gurley here, and I'm well aware of the risks with the knee injury, but I think that it's gone far enough to the point where I'm definitely okay grabbing him in the second round. Um, the tendonitis, or is it arthritis or tendonitis? Arthritis. He's got going on. Okay, so he's got the arthritis that in we the knee. know of. That we yeah, very true. That we know of, um, and I'm sure. I mean, he'll have a lot of time to rest up and get whatever medical stuff he needs to do this this season. Um, I am definitely concerned about his longevity in terms of his career, as well as the 16 games that he can play in 2018. But I think the upside is still the upside of Todd Gurley. Um, If we can get him for 13 games, he could rattle off 15 touchdowns in those 13 games, no doubt, in that Rams offense. So the fact that he's being discounted, you know, in the beginning of the offseason, he was up there with Barkley, and he was probably the 101, and now he's dropping all the way to the 201. I think you kind of have to take that discount, especially when you can, when you already have your first round pick in your lineup, right? I don't want Gurley as my first pick, but if you can have, you know, if if this was a real draft and you know you were picking and you went with a different running back and Todd Gurley was your running back too, right? You went with a running back at Michael Thomas's spot and then went Gurley. Like I think you have a, a really nice little uh, running back slot duo there with Gurley not having that much risk because he isn't the top running back. Are you completely fading Gurley? Yeah. Have you seen my Todd Gurley commercial? No, I have not. Okay. You're going to have to send that to me. Uh, I, I'll, maybe I'll insert it right here. Hey, Smitty, I got a trade offer for you. You give me Alvin Kamara, and I'll give you Todd Gurley. Huh? No Todd Gurley! And then uh, that way the viewers can watch it. But my 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 user base is probably tired of me beating a dead horse on on this topic. But I feel like I always continue to have to because he's going. I understand the 10, 11, 12, 13. I wouldn't take him there, but I do understand why you would. You know, you it makes a lot of sense what you're saying. Um, I get it. That part I understand. <clears throat> but when people are taking Todd Gurley at, you know, I, I see an Instagram post, Nick, where I see Todd Gurley on the on the front of the picture. And it says my, you know, top ten running back rankings are here. My first reaction whenever I see that is, oh, this po- this poor guy's post is being brought back up from the past, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a fresh, yeah, yeah. it's a fresh post by some you know cider writer on on Instagram that's pushing out their rankings, and I'm like, and I just I'm like, how can you have him at the one spot? Like, like the best case scenario, and I had uh, fantasy couch on uh, the last show, and we talked about this, but. As he said, and as I said over and over, what's your best possible scenario for taking him at the 1.01? He's limited. I mean, everybody's explanation when they put him at 1.01 is, well, he could be limited, and you know we're not sure what's going on. It's a disaster if you're taking him as your your top running back or your top overall player. It's just a risk you shouldn't take, in my opinion. So to have him in the second round, I get that. Um, but the fact that we haven't seen him rebound whatsoever you know we're working with information that is he looked horrible like he was running in mud the last time we saw him Um, they've been deceptive about the situation the entire way the team and Todd Gurley we don't even know what's really going on with that knee the same knee that he had ACL surgery in is the one that has arthritis and um, I'd love to hear what your doctor buddy's got on this one but um, Arthritis doesn't get better. The ultimate result is you replace the knee. Not saying that he needs a knee replacement right now, but that's not good. That's his knee is deteriorating. There's no way at his workload, in my opinion, with four straight seasons of elite usage, you know, as big as any running back we have ever seen in the last you know five years that has had a workload uh, that big. He he is the number one player for usage. Um, yes, he didn't run 300 plus carries over and over. That's a good thing, I guess. But he has been used all over the field. And his 2016 season where he was run into the ground, I am very shocked he didn't exit that season with a big injury because he was, he looked awful. And to the, to the point where people actually had him in what, the second or third round heading into 2018? I believe yeah. it was the second, the late second round at, 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 at the earliest. That's how much people doubted him coming out of that year. Uh, so I don't mean to go on a long rant on this one, but I, I personally would still stay away here, but I totally understand you know, taking him this late. I just don't understand taking him anywhere near the top four running backs at all. Well, the, yeah, I mean, the general consensus of America, who isn't you know, thinking about fantasy football at this time of the year, will probably, you know, f- friends and family leagues will have Gurley in the top five, I'm, yeah. I'm assuming, unless, you know, enough of the buzz and the hype from our community kind of gets out there. But 
I would assume he goes top five. And for those of y'all listening, please, please don't do that. Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously there's a ton of risk. I don't know if you can name a riskier player with Todd Gurley. My, uh, Dr. Jesse Morris pretty much said the same thing that you did and that it's like, it's not getting better. It's only going to get worse. He's going to need knee replacements, but he's so young that it's like, that's a huge issue. Um, so, you know, you can listen to all the coach speak about how he's going to be the biggest yeah. part of, of their team game plan and whatnot. But listen, they're probably going to draft another running back. They re-signed Malcolm Brown. Uh, it, they're definitely nervous on their side of things. So, yeah, he, he, I said, yeah, go ahead. Go they ahead. said he was, they're going to use him in the Super Bowl, too. So, like you said, coach speak, don't listen to that. And, and, and they could draft a big name rookie running back. And then what's going to happen? You know, there, like you said, there's no risk here player. There's one other player I'll talk about when we get to that I think is, you know, near, near some, of the same risk, but um, <clears throat> also real quickly, Nick, I went on uh, when I launched my channel because the fantasy football show on YouTube is brand new, despite me being in the industry for 15 years. I launched the video show. I've been on TV, done different things, but this is like the first video show that I've actually created. So I launched that in January, only been up for a little over three months, or yeah, three months. And uh, the fir- one of the first things I did is I did a live 24 hour stream. Where I didn't, wow. I didn't stop streaming. I just did in a 24 hour stream. It took like four one minute bathroom breaks. Um, and that was crazy. Then the second thing I did is I went on and said, no Todd Gurley 5,000 times in a row. It took me like an hour and a half, you know, almost two hours or something like that. I said, no Todd Gurley, no that? Todd Gurley, no Todd Gurley 5,000 times in a row to prove and spread the word about both my channel and the don't trap, don't draft Todd Gurley awareness movement that I've been trying to kick into gear since January. <laughs> so check those, yeah, both those out. I don't re- recommend you watching even more than five minutes of either, but it, it is kind of entertaining to kind of that's click in and look. But uh, that's my stance on Todd Gurley. That's why uh, I think people get tired of it because I beat it like a dead horse. <laughs> right. 212. You're on the clock. Uh, all right. Uh, we'll start moving quicker. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm going to go with Odell Beckham Jr., and I think pairing him with a Mike Thomas or if you're doing those bookend uh, wide receiver picks, man, you, you, you're you going to scoop up uh, you know, a Freeman or a Derrick Henry or you know, grip of, of potential running backs down the way. So love the wide receivers in this range. Yeah, I like that. Um, this is probably where I would start diving into the wide receivers as well. Uh, Odell likely would have been my pick. Um, debatably Julio, who will be my pick right now. Julio, again, one of those guys, just a ridiculously safe floor. I would go Julio over Odell just because I think Odell is very risky compared to the other guys up top. I think the injury risk for him is is very, very real. I don't know if you've ever used the site Sports Injury Predictor before, but Odell Beckham is actually the highest risk of any NFL player this year. They have him slated to miss about like uh, 7.8 games. So basically half the season. He's someone who's dealt with injury since he came into the league. Um, and I think people are kind of like underlooking that just because they're like, oh, the only reason that he's not put up numbers sometimes when you draft him is because he's played with Eli. It's like, no, he's been off the field a lot of the time too. And moving from New York to Cleveland doesn't make him any less of an injury risk. So that's my only problem. Obviously the ceiling goes way higher now that he's in Cleveland with Baker Mayfield. But for me, the only reason I would have been a avoiding him in the first place didn't really have to do with Eli if he was on the field he was producing didn't matter who the fuck was that quarterback him with his injury risk is what scared me so I would have gone Julio there and that's why I'll go with Julio here at the uh at the 13th pick overall yeah uh, we'll, we'll just call him what the numbers are that's fine 13 14 yeah um, whatever yeah the Julio stuff for me can't argue Julio there I, I do like Julio there I do worry about the injuries I do think that you know in a good year to a year and a half we'll start be t- we'll be we'll be talking about Calvin Ridley being the the wide receiver one there, I'm excited about Calvin Ridley. I don't think we'll get to him in this top thirty, but I wanted to mention that. Insert a little Calvin uh, Calvin Ridley action there because I think that he for brand, is, I get it. You what? For for your brand, I get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I think he's going to be one of the biggest breakouts for you know players taken as late as he's going to get taken. Um, I think uh, at this point, man, I, I don't know how I can let David Johnson fall any further at fourteen. Um, I, I think he's he's he could have a big bounce back year. He has some risks, which is why you see him falling to 14 because he's a top potential five running back. But I think, yep. when, again, same thing that we talked about with Cook, when you can get a potential top five running back at a value that, that kind of builds in that risk, I think it's a safe pick. So David Johnson will be 14 for me and ho- hope that they make the changes they need to make to make to get him the ball enough uh, to make him productive in both the passing and, and receiving game. Yeah. I'm, David Johnson has been a tough one for me. Um, I, I just don't know if I trust what's going on there in Arizona. We also haven't seen David Johnson be good in, in – this is going to be three years now. This is going to be the third year, right? Yeah. He missed all 2017, 
and no matter how you twist it, the team wasn't good, but he was also bad too. When you watch him, he wasn't doing anything. He was not the David Johnson of 2016. Um, so that makes me nervous. And he's getting to the age where it's not like, you know, okay, he's 24, 25. I'm sure he'll hit his prime now, but it's like, you know, how many running backs do you see hit their prime, come down from it, and then reinsert themselves as the top running back in the league? So my, my concern is that, I mean, their offense could still be shit. I do like Cliff coming in there and they're going to be more, uh, pass heavy and he will get more opportunities in space. But my, my concern with him is more like, is David Johnson like? Does he even still have that ceiling that people thought he had a couple of years ago? Like, I don't. I'm, I'm not convinced that that is even close to there. Um, so he's another guy that like he is should be the workhorse there. He should get tons of volume. But in reality, what's the difference between David Johnson and a guy like Joe Mixon? Now, I'm not going to take Joe Mixon right now. I think I'm going to let him fall another couple picks. But at the 15th spot, I'm going to go with Juju. Um, I absolutely love Juju this year in Pittsburgh with Antonio Brown gone. His target floor is going to be ridiculously high, right? He was fourth in the NFL in targets last year. Antonio Brown was second. Now Brown is gone. I mean, they are desperate for Juju to take over as that wide receiver one. You obviously know Juju and Ben have this chemistry, even if it is something like they have mutual enemies, so they love each other so much now between the whole Antonio Brown thing. Juju's, you know, he had 166 last year with Brown gone. How do you not pencil him in for 170 minimum, right? Give, obviously, people are going to be like, oh, all of Antonio Brown's targets aren't going to go to Juju. Of course, add on five targets if you want, ten targets if you want, and he's a very good bet to lead the NFL in targets. Now, if you're going to have a guy on your team in fantasy that leads the NFL in targets or at least is top three, he's you know he's a top five fantasy wide receiver. Floor, again, he's just one of these top elite wide receivers whose floor is ridiculously high. Um, I think he had some bad breaks touchdown-wise. I, I looked at some numbers, and I, I can't remember exactly what stat I pulled, but he got tackled inside the two-yard line, I think, five separate times last year. So his touchdown numbers could easily have swung the other way, and you're looking at a guy who caught 110 passes and had 12 touchdowns instead of seven, and he's arguably a top three, two fantasy wide receiver. So I'm all in on Juju as a second-round pick. I can't argue with that at all. I think it's it's kind of funny when people make the argument that he's going to be double-teamed and not be able to find space. There are tons of wide receivers. DeAndre Hopkins, Mike Thomas, that don't have an elite wide receiver next to them. So the argument someone's making is that they don't believe he's a wide receiver one and that's fine they can argue that but i think big ben uh the running game whether it's samuels or connor or both and juju there are not a lot of teams that have that good a core and so yes they lost bell yes they lost antonio brown but they're still very good they're still going to be potent enough and i think juju is an excellent pick there i think he's going to uh you know he had a great year last year but i think he's going to have you know a handful more touchdowns and he will be a wide receiver one that's that's the other thing it's like dude he put up 110 receptions and 1400 yards as a 21 year old like right. this kid people are just like oh i don't know if he's gonna break out it's like dude he already broke out like he's here to stay he's elite yeah. you know and, and if you watch him on on footage or film or whatever you see elite talent it's not like you don't see somebody that is plays a lot like antonio brown knifing around all over the field um he he's gonna get open he's gonna be in today's rules in the NFL, a hard person to really double team. Um, yeah, also, also all game long. Yeah, people also throw the term double team around all the time. Right, but I forget who like did, did the research for it. Like Matt Harmon, who does reception perception. He, you know, when he was looking at the top wide receivers, it's like most of them at the best get double teamed on like 9% of their routes, right. which I know, right. you know, over a, a lot of routes that you're running could be a high number. But at the, but people, I think, that don't understand how the game is played think that like, oh, Antonio Brown is gone, so Juju's going to get double teamed on 70% of his routes. Like that's not a real thing. Also, Juju's best games last year, when you look at the splits, he's had uh, three or four games that Antonio Brown didn't play in, and those were his best statistical games. So he was matched up against the, uh, the cornerback one on yeah. the other team. So I just I think people are just throwing out analysis that they have no actual idea what they're talking about. And are you point. picking that he's not going to get open because he's double teamed or are you picking that Antonio Brown leaving is going to hurt him? I mean, you have to choose yeah. one of one or the other. He, he's a he's a great pick. Uh, I would love to have got him as a third drafted player, um, you know, back when ADPs were starting to, to collect data and unfortunately that yeah. won't be the case. You're going to have to take him this high. I mm-hmm. think this is probably about where you would have to take him if you wanted to make sure you got him in 2019, but very warranted pick. I like it. 
Um, so the 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 elusiveness that we're talking about with Juju and why he can get open regardless of you know defensive scheming and all that uh, is the same reason I'm putting Antonio Brown here. I know a lot of people aren't going to like this this spot, but I you know he hasn't shown decline just like Bell hasn't shown decline. So I think just because he's changing teams, just because he's hated, he's easy to hate. Um, I think he's going to have a chip on his shoulder this year and have a pretty big year considering. Um, so like David Johnson above and Antonio Brown here. I think that the risk is kind of baked into the value. Um, so would I want to take them top five? I'm expecting hopefully top five out of both those guys, but I'm not, I'm going to conservatively draft them in a place that has room for error. And I think uh, 16 overall. Are we at 16? 16 that overall. 16. Yeah. I think that's a good spot for Antonio Brown. I could go a couple different ways, I'll be honest, but that's just the player that I'm going to to select. Yeah, I like, uh, I like Antonio Brown down there. Um, I I'm a little nervous. It's very, very rare that you see a wide receiver switch a team and he continues to put post like the same numbers he had or better. But Antonio Brown, you know, when you look at the team overall, he should still compete for like 160 targets. And anytime you have a wide receiver with his talent getting that kind of volume, you're going to get good numbers coming out of him. So, um, yeah, I mean, Brown is as like a late second round pick is absolutely fine there. Um, there is, of course, risk, but. That's whatever. They got three three first round picks in the draft. They're not done revamping this this offensive attack. So it's quite humorous when when everybody already counts Oakland out. Oakland's going to do. Derek Carr was once considered an up and coming quarterback. I'm not saying he will be a top fantasy guy by any means, but to say that he with Antonio Brown the addition, or if they draft DK Metcalf and give Antonio Brown even more room to maneuver and find you know open spaces on the field. I just I can't wait till the draft's over and see where Antonio Brown kind of goes up or down. Yeah, I can't wait for the for the draft to see what happens there. The other thing is too, like we don't know what Derek Carr is. That's what makes me nervous. Like if I'm going to take a wide receiver in fantasy, like if there's ever a tiebreaker, it's I don't like to look farther than the quarterback. Like I'm not necessarily. I don't think Ben is great, and he he had a shitty year efficiency wise. He put up the most like pass attempts and passing yards and things like that. But efficiency wise, it was bad. But we know what Ben is. He's going to sling the ball. He's going to take shots down the field, which is great for Juju, whatever. Derek Carr, we don't really know who he is as a player, right? He could be good. You're right. Like, he was a couple of years removed from being an MVP candidate almost, mm-hmm. and last year he was miserable. So it's like, what happens if we get the miserable Derek Carr again? Like, that's that's going to be bad yeah. for Antonio Brown. So that's, like, the risk that I would factor True. into it. Um, so at pick 17, ooh, there's two guys I really like here. Um, don't do it. Hmm. I'm going to I'm gonna leave you – with the running backs i'm gonna take travis kelsey here i'm gonna take kelsey here at 17 i think he's an absolute steal uh i would honestly there was a lot of guys that i still liked on the board otherwise i i would have taken kelsey as a top 12 14 guy uh i i think you look at what gronk did in his prime and gronk was consistently like a top eight top seven fantasy pick first round people were using the first round pick on him and kelsey's putting up arguably you know, similar numbers to what Gronk was doing in his prime. And he has Patrick Mahomes coming into his prime. If Tariq Hill misses time, Travis Kelsey is going to get 12 to 15 targets a game, especially over that first six to eight games. I don't know. I, I, I think Travis Kelsey is a can't-miss guy. And that's a position that's so, you know, there's just not a lot of guys that you can throw into your lineup and expect production from. He has such a big positional advantage. When you look at, you know, Travis Kelsey as the tight end one down to whoever, like, the tight end eight is, he's going to give you, like, seven extra points a game when you look yeah. back at the numbers. But – when you look at that from like a wide receiver standpoint, the number drop off is not significant whatsoever. It's like a point and a half, two points per game from wide receiver one to seven. So when you look at the positional advantage, you might not like using a, a top tight end, uh, a, a top pick on a tight end this early, but the numbers say that it's a good pick. And uh, I would be excited to get to kick Kelsey down here at 17. Okay. Yeah. No, it's uh, uh, it, it's not my style to draft a tight end early, but it doesn't mean that they're not valued right around there. They're, the picks warranted definitely for sure. Um, the, the points are there. The as you want to say X factor. A lot of people call that thinking. You know, he outscores the last starting tight end in your league by probably the biggest margin at this point. So can't argue it whatsoever. I'm just more about finding the next Kelsey um, sleeper. You, my other uh, site uh, right here. Um, all about rankings, bold predictions. That's my, my main site. The video stuff's on the fantasyfootballshow.com. But um, and and landing bold predictions like the next tight end, like David Njoku's one um, that I think you can grab really late and kind of maybe clean up if he ends up having a double digit touchdown season. Um, so I I typically build teams passing on a QB or a tight end early, but I cannot argue that whatsoever. Um, I just find walking out of my draft. 
I'm unhappy with the overall feel of my team when I go early at tight end. So that's the I main agree. thing. Yeah. Um, but I think this year is uh, uh, maybe it's the same with most years, and I'm just you know repeating what I normally say. But the, I did feel okay with it for a while, and then. Um, you know, with the David and Joku thing, I was like, yeah, I'm pretty excited about this. And then they added Odell Beckham, and then they added Demarcus Robinson. I'm just like, and then they're talking about how he's not a good blocking tight end, like from Cleveland, their front office. So I'm like, ooh, that kind of drops him out of someone that I would like like as like a late round pick. And then I don't know, I just feel like there's a lot of different things going on with the guys that I kind of liked in the middle tier mm-hmm. uh, that make me a little bit nervous. So now it's like, okay, now I really want to make sure I get one of those top top three guys yeah um, so normally if it's my team only because we're kind of going by it's almost right. like we're going by rankings at this right. point right my team right. i'm going to be looking to target whoever falls to the third round whether it's kelsey Ertz, or kittle yeah um you're right. I, I like my team how it turns out at the end when i don't use a top two pick on tight end and probably mm-hmm. even a top three but you know you can't have your cake and eat it too so i'd normally be looking at third round pick for uh for a tight end and my advice to people is always go best player available in your mind you can't stray wrong you can't walk out of a draft um disappointed in your team when you like every single pick you make it's the people that go in a tier and they're like well i have to pick this player because they're at the very last pick player in that tier i don't like the player (laughs) i doubt the player but i'm gonna draft the player because they're in this tier i hate that kind of thinking uh so i always go best player available and if he's your best player then you know you take him regardless of you know fears of of you know having a team you might not like but that's i typically do walk out and be like man i don't like the balance of this team um i'm gonna go with uh i'm gonna keep letting the running back fall but uh mike evans will be my pick at 18 i contemplated going um terry kill here but uh, I'm going to go with Mike Evans. I think they're going to air it out. Uh, he, his injuries worry the heck out of me, which is why I hesitated to pick him. Um, if I had the same pick, let's say, in scenario in two different leagues, I would not double up and take Mike Evans in both of them and put all my eggs in one basket. But I think I do want some shares of Mike Evans in 2019. And, and number 18 overall isn't that risky. I think it's got some good upside. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. He's one of my favorite guys that, like, you know, with, with Deshaun Jackson gone, like Mike Evans is going to get all those deep balls. He, he was, you know, before Deshaun Jackson came to Tampa Bay, Mike Evans was consistently among the league leaders and targets. There's no reason that's going to change now with Deshaun Jackson and Adam Humphrey's gone again. So uh, I, I love Mike Evans, someone you can – I've seen him go in the third round in a lot of drafts, so I'm, I'm all about that. Um, now, at pick 19, I'm going to go with Joe Mixon. Um, you know, he's set up to be the workhorse here, and – I'm nervous about the offense overall. You know, what Andy Dalton do we see? We have a new head coach, a new offensive coordinator, neither of whom have proven anything in the NFL. So, yes, it's nice to switch it up. And we're like, okay, no more Marvin Lewis. Um, At least, you know, they'll get some rejuvenation in the offense. And hopefully that means getting Mixon more involved in the passing game. Um, But, you know, he was a good player last year. And I don't think he's going to be a league winner, but he's going to be someone that's really, really solid in that RB slot. And if you go running back heavy or if I mean, if you go with a wide receiver in the first round and you can get Joe Mixon in the 15 to 18 range, I think he will finish as a back end uh, running back one that, again, won't probably won't win you your league because I just don't think the situation is ripe enough for him to have the ceiling of a a Kamara or a Zeke or anything like that. Um, But Mixon had a great year last year with a lot of things working against him. So Mixon this late. Is uh, I think is a, a solid pick. Yeah, um, I I have some doubts about that, but at that range, you're looking at I think less risk. So, you know, I think both of the OC and the head coach were what like QB coaches. I think. Yeah. Beforehand, I don't think they have any co- head coaching experience, and you yeah, give them no, Andy Dalton no, as the coordinator. Yeah. yeah, here's Andy Dalton, guys, here, and your specialty <laughs> that you have. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> it worries me, and uh, I think they'll be down passing a lot. That's good for for Boyd, who I think has you know potential breakout potential in the later rounds. And I like A.J. Green a little bit if his value continues to stay low. Um, but I, I'm avoiding that running back situation as long as I can, um, which is why with this next pick, I'm still not going uh, running back here. At some point, I'm going to have to uh, so that our, our mock doesn't look too jacked up. <laughs> but I'm making a point here um, as well with another player. But uh, Patrick Mahomes, I think I'm going to slot here to prove a point. Uh-huh. Not that I would take him this high because ADP dictates I do not have to. So if anybody is screaming and you know yelling at the the monitor right now saying you know why would you draft him here you don't have to at year's end you're going to reflect back and say he was worth this 20 overall pick easily and I think that if his value climbed this high I would still pay it not in every league because you can still get Aaron Rodgers sometimes in the fourth you can still get Baker Mayfield 
after that. Those are some of my top, you know, three of my top four QBs in 2019. So I see the value in that. I've been doing this for 15 years. I understand waiting on a QB is trendy. I understand the value behind that. But when a guy can throw 50 TDs, and maybe that's somebody's argument against drafting Mahomes this year, but when someone can throw 50 TDs, they can win you a league, especially if that player is your second or third drafted player. Um, So I would make him my third drafted player because I can. But if he climbed into this value, I'd have no problem taking him and pairing him with like a Zeke or a Camara and win week in and week out because I, I feel like I could fill around those holes that that could create better than than people think that you know one could. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm of the the waiting on the quarterback thing. Uh, I probably won't touch Mahomes unless he falls into the fourth round. Uh, maybe if I'm in like seven redraft leagues, I'll try to get him early because I owned him in multiple super flex leagues last year. And my God, I, I am going to miss that guy being in in the, in the top of my lineup, man. He was something else. But I also think you're paying for what he did last year, and uh, and I do think he'll be quarterback one again. His numbers will drop off. That's just I think that's just normal efficiency speaking. But I'll still end up with 40 passing touchdowns, probably five rushing touchdowns, which will be good for quarterback one numbers. But I think if you can get Andrew Luck like three rounds later with that offensive line, it's just going to be ridiculous. Them adding weapons probably to the draft. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm going to wait on quarterbacks. It's, I do still think there are some really solid players on the board still. You know what's um, interesting, real quick, if you don't mind? Uh, yeah. What's interesting, though, and this is what I call like a, a certain kind of like gap in thinking for people when they're uh, – I'm not referring to you – but in, yeah. when they're in a, in a draft versus in, in season. So like a guy like Mahomes, people would let fall – pretty far like and again i can't emphasize enough i would not take him 20 overall kind of proving a point here with him being that high um but if everybody passed on him to the tune of a third round pick let's say and you can take him in the third as soon as week one kicks off like i don't even care if they haven't even played week one yet but especially if they play week one and he's done really well and he throws four touchdowns you can't trade for him for anything, maybe one of the top three or four running backs. So it's a funny thing in fantasy football. Something I've seen for my entire time in the industry is that the value of that top QB, if there is a forty-five plus uh, passing TD, the value changes dramatically once kickoff starts. And to me, that indicates that there's a huge, huge sleeper potential or value that that you shouldn't be getting at that position when you can draft a guy in the third round, but you can't trade even anybody outside the top five to acquire them once the whistle blows. And that's what we're going to see with Mahomes, just like you last year. You loved him. I mean, you wouldn't have traded him for probably anybody in the top five. I know you're saying that it will be a different. You what? Superflex. Superflex leagues, I wouldn't. I mean, I think he'll be a top five pick. In one quarterback leagues, I I would have sent him, uh, if someone's offering me a a top five running back, he's off the game in a second. Outside of the top five. But like someone like, uh, you know, if it depends on your backup, but in a lot of leagues, people won't trade them you're up at 21 i'm going to grab let me look at the board for a second we'll pretend i'm on the clock right now the sweat's dripping down i'm nervous um what pick was that that was 20 so we're at 21 okay um i'm gonna go with another tight end here i'm gonna go with george kittle and it's kind of the um Similar argument I had with Juju Smith-Schuster. It's like he just went for 110 and 1,400 at a, as a 21-year-old. George Kittle just set the receiving record as a, as a uh, for a tight end as a 20 in his second year in the league with backup quarterbacks. Like George Kittle is – I think we're going to get like a, a Gronk-ish prime year from George Kittle, but you're getting him in the third round where you had to draft Gronk in, in the first round. Um, and I think getting Jimmy G back is – I just think George Kittle is, is such a safe pick with – with and he's not just a safe pick. His ceiling is ridiculously high too. He's such a good player with the ball in his hands, right? He's, he's one of those yak guys that you can kind of count on that year over year because you know he's going to make plays, right? He's explosive, and that's what you look for in breakout tight ends, guys who can, one, catch the ball, right? They're reliable. They're involved down by the red zone, and they make plays after the catch. Those are the things that I look for, right? And I think George Kittle – checks all those boxes um so i'm very high on him here and i just think you, you can go with the riskier pick right i'm looking at some of the adps right now there's like sony michelle up here and some uh, some of the wide receivers are pretty safe and there's like james connor and nick chubb are obviously still on the board but i see a lot of risk in those guys and i see almost zero risk with a guy like george kittle so i am i'm like i said getting one of those top three tight ends in, in most of my drafts 
Um, I, that's good. Good pick. I understand the value there again. Um, probably something I wouldn't do, but I definitely get it. And his his value is you know it's warranted. Um, Tyree Kill. I'm going to throw in here. I know there's some risk of you know possible missed games. We haven't heard much of that lately. Um, but I think at this point, without knowing any of that, maybe it gets pushed into the next year. Maybe nothing comes of it. I think yeah. he's a pretty big steal at this point. Given I think this is about as far as I let him fall. Yeah, that, that's me too. I, I was doing my rankings and I had him at wide receiver nine, and literally, of course, only because the off-field stuff. He's probably wide receiver three or four, if not. That's right. the other thing with Patrick Mahomes too. If Tyree Kill is not on the field for Patrick Mahomes, that's a monster hit to him. If he doesn't have him for six or eight games, like Patrick Mahomes, I think falls back to arguably where Andrew Luck and Aaron Rodgers are being picked, um, in my opinion, because Tyree Kill is such a field stretcher. But yeah, this is I wouldn't let Tyree Kill fall any farther than that. It's gonna, you know, we'll know a lot more about the situation once the off-field stuff hits. Um, and now I will start looking at these running backs that have more risk, but a lot of upside as well. I'll go with Nick Chubb over James Conner. I know Kareem Hunt will be back after eight games, um, but I think during those first eight games, which is more than half of your fantasy season, Nick Chubb is going to throw up a thousand yards from scrimmage. This is a, this is going to be a high-powered offense. He is going to get all the goal line work. He can hit home runs at any point. We saw that last year with multiple, you know, long touchdown runs that. Um, you know, just made him have these ridiculously high fantasy games. Someone, he's just a ridiculous athlete. You look at any of his metrics and his speed scores. Um, and Nick Chubb is going to be the guy for a long time. I don't, Kareem Hunt, I think, will come back and probably take a little bit of the passing work, but Nick Chubb might get you, literally lock you into a playoff spot over the first half of the year. So I, I like Nick Chubb here, even though the Kareem Hunt risk is there. All right. Um, yeah, I agree with you um, that he has value. I do think that if you could let him fall into the third rounder as a third drafted player, which we in a 12 team league be on the borderline for, um, that's when I start looking to invest and do everything I can to handcuff him to uh, to Cream Hunt. Because I think if you got him both, you're safe. If you're taking Nick, Nick Chubb in the top like 12, top 15, that's when I think you're running a big risk um, yeah. that later on you're going to get you know screwed. Um, uh, okay, so I tried my hardest not to draft James Conner. I've been waiting for you to just. I gave him, him to you. Yeah, I, I, I just you. keep, and I, I don't even. I'm still. Everyone's gonna be shocked that I even do this because I have so much on this too. But I think that if he did fall to me at what would be just about third round value, I would do everything I can to handcuff him to Samuels and then feel pretty comfortable with it. So he has a seven to nine ADP in some cases, and depending on the ADP that you look at, um, but top ten overall player. So we've we've made a big statement here, letting James Conner fall all the way to 24 overall. James Conner, to me, um, he was my number two bold prediction last year out of all players in fantasy written before there was talk about Bell even holding out. So I love the guy. I don't think there's anybody that wrote bolder things than I did on Conner last year. But he enters a totally different situation with Jalen Samuels kind of being this year's version of James Conner, um, that running backs coach coached him in college. Um, so he there's some rapport there. And he... And, and Samuels looked every bit as good. And something I wrote in that bold prediction, which people forget, because I said together they would be the sleeping giant that would win leagues in 2019, written so far before Bell was going to hold out. Um, I don't think I even talk about Bell holding out in the prediction. But my point is that Samuels is that important to me. And I badly want to pass on Connor here. Um, but this is a value I'd be willing to pay and to make sure that I handcuff the two together. I probably would, I would do Nick, and I've told people this, that if you do see me draft Gurley or you see me draft Connor in 2019, it's to trade him. And I think when you have a seven to nine overall value, but you're falling to 24, I'll take the chance. I'll cuff him no matter what. And I'll take the chance that I don't trade him, but I'm probably going to turn him into a player that we took six, seven spots up above because he could probably command that, especially if you toss in something crazy, something crappy. Yeah. So go, yeah. Connor. Everyone's going to be shocked. Uh, yeah, I think if uh, well, if you're in my my audience listening to this, you're definitely not going to be shocked because I'm on board with you 100. percent Jalen Samuels is the back I'm going to own in this backfield ten rounds later than than James Connor. Um, I just I, I don't think Connor's that great of a running back. He doesn't create yards that well on his own. He does everything well. But he won't be as involved in the passing game as he was last year. Um, so I'm definitely letting James Conner fall. I realize, too, looking at the board, because he dropped down a little bit. For me, um, if I were able to make the Nick Chubb pick again, I would swap. I would have went Nick Chubb here, and Marlon Mack would have been the guy I took before James Conner. I absolutely love Marlon Mack this year. Um, looking at that situation, he played in 12 games last year, and he scored 10 touchdowns, had 1,000 yards from scrimmage. That offensive line is elite. They're young. They have the same five starters coming back. Continuity is a huge piece of offense and offensive line. They're going to be arguably, I think they were the fifth highest scoring offense in the NFL last year. And if you look at the top 
four teams above them. I think all of them have question marks, and I wouldn't be surprised whatsoever if the Colts were the number one scoring offense in the league next year. Um, and what would that mean for Marlon Mack? If Marlon Mack had 10 touchdowns last year, coming into the year injured, missing time, um, 10 touchdowns last year, there's no reason why he can't score 12 to 14 touchdowns this year as a lead back. They're coming out again and saying that he could be the featured back. Do we want to see more involvement in the passing game? Absolutely. But in college, he was very involved in the passing game. So whereas people always make the arguments like, oh, you know, Derrick Henry, if they threw him the ball, he could catch. It's like, no, you're just saying that. We've literally never seen it happen. Marlon Mack was a very good pass catcher in college. Yeah, very so, good. Yeah, so if they decide to use him in that role, I think Marlon Mack could easily – his pace numbers last year, if you pace him out to 16 games, were 1,500 yards from scrimmage and like 13, 14 touchdowns. So let's go. Marlon Mack, roll up. He was uh, running back one a lot of the time he was playing. So I, I agree that the talents there. He was on my bold predictions the year prior, um, and he kind of disappointed. So, um, you know, I was definitely bummed about seeing him get going last year versus the year prior. But I think Mack um, – I think that's a little high for my my taste, but I think that you can, and like we were saying, we're going to make some points in this draft, but wait to ADP. So I think he'll fall a lot further than this. So you, you're you in luck because you're going to own Marlon Mack at probably way less value than this, or further you, down the road. Me all the Marlon. I think yeah. he's I think he's very similar to <laughs> Todd Gurley. The year that Todd Gurley had that bad year, and then he was being taken in the third round of fantasy drafts, I was looking at their numbers, and their per-game numbers Rushing yards, rushing attempts, receiving yards, reset, like t- touchdowns, like almost nearly identical. And I think we're going to see. And I'm looking at the team's comparison. I'm like, well, what was what what happened that year, and what happened in the year next year? Like, what did Gurley need in order to become that elite fantasy back? And it was a great offensive line. That's what Marlon Mack has. A great, you know, offensive scheme. That's what they have in Indy, and they have Andrew Luck. Man, I just I see no way that Marlon Mack doesn't finish the year with 12 plus touchdowns. Yeah. Um, I'm torn between two guys here, so I could go either way. Um, I, I think I'm going to drop. Oh man, let's see. I'm going to go with uh, Mark Ingram here. I think he's going to get the volume. Wow. wow! I think his ADP will warrant top thirty to thirty-five overall ish range coming up here soon. But I want to squeeze him into this thirty to you know. I, I get it, he's older. He's not a dynasty guy. This is a redraft league, so we're not necessarily picking for the future. Um, I think the volume will be there and he could definitely have that, you know, ten plus T D rushing season uh with, you know, top low end running back one numbers in, in two thousand nineteen. So uh a little higher than I think most would take him at this point, but I think his ADP is gonna climb. Yeah, he's someone that I'm completely avoiding uh, inside the top 50 picks, to be honest with you. I think we're going to see a situation where he's uh, very much like Alex Collins. They just don't commit to one back. I don't think Ingram's going to catch any passes there, really. Um, so that that was a surprise for me, but I love it. Like you said, it's all about the bold takes here. We're taking the guys that we like. Um, and again, I don't think you'll necessarily have to take Ingram there. Um, yeah. But if he is, you know, if, if he does end up going up there, he'll be someone I will be avoiding. And why not as the – let me complete the trifecta of tight ends. I will take Zach oh. Ertz gladly here. Um, PPR, absolute machine. I Again, I forgot this was PPR. I usually play half PPR. If it's full, um, I would – debate going Zach Ertz where I took Kittle and then swap that because Ertz is just a monster when it comes to catching passes. Wentz back, love that chemistry, so uh, give me all the, the Zach Ertz at pick 27. You are a tight end friendly machine, I will say. Yes, I <laughs> this is the, the point I'm making. It's like yeah. you got to get one of those three tight ends, and you're going to ha- if you want to do no. that, you're going to have to take him in the first three. Yeah, can't emphasize enough that we would use ADP to our advantage this whole way. So just make sure everybody understands that we're not suggesting you take Ingram. I'm not suggesting you take Ingram early. He's not suggesting you take Mac uh, that early. Um, you know, we're we're in Mahomes at 20. You could take Mahomes probably at the late third. Um, and get away with it in a lot of leagues. So these are all. This can help with auction too, just to kind of show like where we're valuing these guys, like how how much we may be willing to pay. I think if push comes to shove, so Mac, you're willing to pay the price if you need to. Um, this next guy, I am a little torn on, but I think that if his situation stays the same, this would be a screaming steal. But Damian Williams at number 28 overall could be a top five running back. He was like epically efficient. And, and utilized so well in that offense and fit so perfectly. I do fear that they will draft somebody. We will see. But I think they also have shown some confidence in him. Um, I think they, they signed into a, a longer deal, right? They extended him, yeah, like after week 15 or 16 last yeah, year. Yeah, so, uh, you know, that's a good sign. Um, yeah. But clearly some risk. But I think that at pick 30-ish overall, you're looking at a guy that could be a top 5 to 10 running back. 
Yeah, yeah not a lot left. Yeah, I think um, I think in real drafts, I think Damian Williams probably. I mean, the NFL draft is going to dictate exactly what we're going to you know have to do with Damian Williams, whether or not they draft someone in the first three rounds. Um, if they don't draft someone in the first three rounds, I would imagine Damian Williams starts being picked in, in like the top 15 overall. Um, I think that's where people are going to start taking him. And it's because he's in the Chiefs offense, man. If you want the starting running back in that offense, it's like clockwork. Whoever you throw in there is going to average a touchdown a game, catch two, three, four, five passes a game. So, um, yeah, Damian Williams all the way down here is a ridiculously good value, although I don't imagine that we'll see that happening too often in real drafts. Um, at pick 29, this is my yep. last pick. Uh, I'm going to go with T.Y. Hilton here. He just keeps being written off. Um, and, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of the Colts offense this year. I can't imagine anyone's not. That's very fucking easy words for me to say. Um, but, you know, why not take number one <coughs> receiver in that offense every year? Like, what has T.Y. Hilton done besides perform as a, as a top fantasy wide receiver? His numbers last year on a per game basis were exactly the same. They were actually better. I looked at it. They were better than they were in 2016 when he was a top five fantasy wide receiver. Um, but people, people are like, oh, you see what he did in 2017? He kind of fell off. It was like, dude, he wasn't playing with Andrew Luck. Andrew Luck is back. We saw, you know, T.Y. Helen grinded through last year's injuries, and he still had games where he was putting up like 160 yards with a bum ankle. Um, so it will, again, depend on what they do in the draft. But I think this offense has a ridiculous upside. If they take a rookie even in the first round, he's not going to supplant T.Y. Hilton as a wide receiver one on that team. Right. You don't just come in as a rookie and throw up 1,200 yards, right? That's still T.Y. Hilton as a deep ball for Andrew Luck, who's another year gone from that shoulder injury. So third round, I'm all in on Hilton, too. Okay. I like it. Um, so, And then when I'm done with this pick, maybe we'll throw out a couple names um, that we think – maybe miss the cut that, that could be considered or, you know, hey, that's a good value here. But Devonta Freeman, I think, is someone I'm going to throw out, even though you could probably get him a little bit later. I think he's the last, well, not the last. I think uh, Derrick Henry's got some potential to be top 10. But Freeman has top 6 to 10 running back appeal, and I think a lot of risk is, you know, is is available to, he, can, he could definitely weather through some ups and downs at this value. And Ido Smith, you could handcuff pretty easily but i think we're looking at a very very good running back yes they're going to throw a lot more but he, he, fortunately for him he's very good in the passing game and i think they're going to lean on him a lot in 2019 he'll be one of those comeback players that uh, i think really surprises uh, but i'm actually i'm a falcons fan um and i am i'm staying away from freeman man i think i think his his top to your status is done as a fantasy running back. You should, um, it, I think you said you didn't see it already. You should watch the episode that I had Dr. Jesse Morse on, and he talks about Freeman too. I just think the violent style of running that he plays with, paired with the fact that he's not a bigger back, is not good for him. And I, I, I think we're going to see him turn into a two down grinder this year. And I think Edo Smith is going to take a lot of the passing down work. And I think that, um, I also think the Falcons draft the running back in this draft. That would change some things for sure. Yeah, I think Damian Harris from Alabama would be a good fit in Atlanta, but I think they draft someone probably within the top four rounds at the position. Um, Freeman just scares me. I don't like the injury concerns, and I just think that you know his involvement in the receiving game has gone down year over year over year. They like Smith there, who was a great pass catcher in college. And uh, like you said, Dirk Cutter's offensive scheme is not – favored towards the running backs they go very heavy heavily towards the wide receivers and stuff so i'm 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 bull i'm not um not too high on devonta freeman this year he scares me a lot derrick henry was left out adam thielen was left out keenan allen uh, mari cooper uh aaron jones um philip Lindsay, terry cohen um sony michelle uh aj green all guys that fell out of that um who's yeah. your favorite if you had to pick one of the guys that just named off if you need me to read them off again i can no, I got him in front of me. It would probably be one of the wide receivers, just because I think at this point in the draft, a lot of the running backs tend to get very risky. Um, so I would like a, a Thielen who just got that fat contract extension. Um, Keenan Allen would probably be my next one as well. So I'd probably go Thielen and Keenan Allen because we know what Thielen is, right? He's he's one of those big slot receivers that's going to get a ton of targets, regardless of you know who's at quarterback. But it's Kirk, and he loves Thielen. So I think I don't think we see what we saw the first half of the year, but I definitely don't think we see what we saw over the second half. So I think we find a we kind of find somewhere in the middle, you know, twelve hundred yards, eight to ten touchdowns, and I'll take that, you know, early fourth round. Um, and same thing with Keenan Allen. So uh, PPR, you know, both of them are going to get theirs. All right. Well, hey, man, I appreciate you doing this. One more pick uh, before yeah. we uh, end the show. One of your biggest bull predictions that you want people to know about for 2019. Don't mean to put you on the spot there, but. 
Yeah, no, I think uh, I think I'll circle back to Marlon Mack, and I think we see Marlon Mack finish the year. I don't know how bold. I don't want to like get to the point where it's like ridiculous and say he's number one, but I, I, I'm going to go Marlon Mack top three running back in uh, in in 2019. Okay, mine's actually I should have rephrased that. It could be anything. Um, mine's more of a <laughs> dynasty. Uh, prediction, but I'm going to say my best and biggest prediction, the one that I feel the most strongly about in the bold range, would be that by this time next year, I'm not saying he'll play this well in his rookie year, but I think Nikhil Harry is going to be a top four wide receiver in all of fantasy within one to two years. Not, not saying it's going to happen. I'm, we're going to see it sprinkled in to the season, you know, showing flashes of brilliance along the way, but in a year to one, one to two years. We'll be talking about him with the Adams, the Hopkins, the Mike Thomases. I see elite talent. Sometimes you, you know, you have, there's a lot of stats to go off too, but sometimes you see something in a player and that's what I've done and tried to captivate in everything I do is sometimes there's a lot of gut instinct that goes into things. And when I watch him play, I see it. He's yep. going to be elite. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I have no argument there. He's my one on one in Dynasty. There's no questions asked if I'm the first pick in that. It's Nikhil Harry. Um, so, yeah, if you're in a keeper league or if you're in a dynasty startup and you see him dropping, whatever, make sure you get Harry because he is going to be a monster for years to come. I also love A.J. Brown, but we're not going to get off on a whole rookie um, tangent here. But, yeah, I'm with you on Nikhil Harry. Love that guy. All right. Thanks for coming on, Nick. I appreciate you coming on, man. Uh, good to yeah. meet you, too. This is the first time we've ever done a video or kind of had a chance to talk face to face. So uh, pleasure. And uh, thanks. Yeah, man, it was a lot of fun. Uh, thanks for having me on. And for my audience, make sure that you're going to um, follow him on the all, all the stuff you know, yeah. on, on the skateboard behind his head, which I will link again down below in the description. So it's been a good one. A lot of value came out of this. Make sure you hit that thumbs up button. Make sure you subscribe to both of our channels if you are new. And uh, we should link up again throughout the summer. Talk Definitely, more man. fantasy. Definitely. Okay, so we're here with Nick from Big Dogs Got to Eat Fantasy Football. Very glad to have you on the show, Nick. I appreciate you coming on, and uh, I'd love for you to tell my viewers, and I'm sure your viewers will be watching this too, But so this part might be boring for them. Maybe we'll throw this at the end. Uh, but tell them a little bit about you, um, where you came from, and, and like about what time you came into the fantasy football industry. Sure. Uh, I mean, I've been playing fantasy football since I was uh, you know, a little girl, and I'm maybe 10 years old or whatnot, and uh, I've been playing for a long time i got serious probably um four or five years ago i started a youtube channel when the uh when the platform was very unsaturated if you want to put it um and i've just been putting consistent content out videos you know whether it's relating to just overall draft strategy rankings mock drafts anything fantasy football related um I'm all about. So uh, my main platform is definitely YouTube. I convert all of my stuff into podcast format. So you can kind of catch me anywhere on all the social media platforms. But that is the quick gist of where I'm at. It is a beautiful Sunday. You know, we're, we're usually not doing too much football on Sundays while it's the off season. Um, but that was how we had to uh, get this done today. And the Masters just wrapped up. We just saw Tiger come home with the W. So, it, so it's been a good sports day thus far. And uh, I'm looking to make it even better. And then we got Game of Thrones tonight. So it's definitely. all great up here. Definitely excited for Game of Thrones. That's like what today is all about. Everything's planned around Game of, Th of Thrones today. Um, so I guess my my first uh, last question in this, and we'll get into some fantasy football mock drafting for the viewers. But uh, what what was it that got you into the fantasy football industry, though? Like what made you, what pushed you in? Because I think for any of us that kind of got in with a passion, I know I did. Um, it sounds like you did, too. What pushed you in that direction? Yeah, I mean, I had always just had so much fun playing the game uh, with my friends and we had been so into it and I kind of just took a step back and I was like, I feel like I could probably help people with this. There are a lot of people that don't really, you know, there's so much noise out there um, and it's hard to understand what what's actually helping you become a better player, what's like predictive in a sense. And I always felt like I was a good medium at being able to wipe away the things that were like not as important. And, uh, you know, people just don't have as much time to spend doing it as I do. So I always just felt like a good middleman and, and being able to figure out what was um, important and conveying that in a simple message. So it was, it was a, a combined passion of, you know, just the, the game and the sport itself. And then what I thought I could kind of put a twist on or, or um, you know, add some value on and give it to my audience. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of similar 
to how it happened for me, but mine was a, a quite a, li- what, a long time ago. Um, 2004, 2005 is when I got into the industry. And uh, I'm not sure if you know this or if your view- viewers will know this, but um, I'm actually on the longest radio show, fantasy football radio show in the world. It's been going 23 years. I joined 15 years ago, um, but it's on CBS Sports, 1580 AM here in Phoenix, and it's been going on 23 years. It's with Russ Bliss, and it's uh, it's awesome, man. It's uh, that's kind of how I started in it, and I did it doing like bold predictions. I got tired of, I got tired of people not having content in like January, in February, you know, right right after the Super Bowl. I wanted to find rankings, and nobody had it out there. There are a couple yeah. sites out there like Football Guys. Um, they had some tools and things like that. And I've been pretty innovative. Uh, in the industry, and I, I did run a couple of big sites, and the reason I'm, my my brand is new and kind of looking like an infant an infant state type brand is because these are new brands. I've, I've branched out on my own again uh, to to build these up, and so that's why I'm I'm here with you trying to get the word out. Uh, you know, because you're going to have me on your show, I'm going to have you on your show, and hopefully we get some people knowing about both of us in both of our circles. So um, glad to have you on here. I appreciate you coming on. Uh, and any shout outs you do on my behalf and uh, definitely will tell people to come visit you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, all your information, all the shows and stuff um, that you want the people to find you at, I will link down, down below Perfect. in the description. So yep. make sure you're following my mans over here. Uh, yeah. 